Thank you uh, on behalf of everyone here for, for going through that. That's informative for me. <laughs> also, um, we do, do, of course, have some questions as well um, that have opened up as well. So, yeah, sort of want to run through, if we may, just sort of 30 minutes of question. Um, obviously, any questions that are in the chat, please pop them there. I've got a couple that I've picked out here, um, which I'll sort of uh, put to you. Um, okay, so if I wanted to release a remix of a tune, or a song, uh, what is the best way to contact the label or publisher? Okay, uh, a remix of a tune. Well, you'd need to contact the publisher because technically it's an adaptation of an existing piece of music. So the publisher has to give permission. Um, if he gives that permission, um, then that's fine. That's that's the main part of the work out of the way. Um, the remix is presumably, if it's a remix, you're, you're, whoever is asking is going to be making that remix. So he would own the recording. So he wouldn't really need to ask a record label unless he's taking a bit of another, another recording and mixing it in. If he's using part of an existing recording, got to ask that record label as well so two people to ask the publisher because remixing is an adaptation and the record label if he's using some of this if he's doing a completely fresh recording uh then doesn't need to ask the record label I hope that answers the question um uh, i've got another one here as well um bit of a long question so again just let me know if you need to, need to repeat it but i'm recording an expanded cover of a tv theme from a 90 from the 1970s i have the writers and publishers permission on email to release it on streaming services youtube and vinyl the publisher has said i need to register the version with the prs slash mcps and this will facilitate the correct distribution of any royalties and credits for the respective people involved. I'm not too sure what the question is uh, there, but yeah, just sort of your... Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's that's the right thing to do because if you're if you're adapting an existing piece, but you're using, you know, elements of the existing song and you've got the publisher's blessing, then yes, you can, you can create a new arrangement. It's like, you know, it's like rewriting an existing song. You give some of the royalties to the existing writers, but you've created a new one. So you will get a share and the PRS decide how much that share is going to be. But yeah, that's, that, that's good. And that's, that's a good way to do it. And good that you've got the permission of the publisher because that's, uh, that's the first major step. Wonderful. Uh, another one here. Uh, recorded a cover of a Daft Punk tune. Uh, in line with everything that's going on at the moment, <laughs> I was wondering if I could get this uploaded to Spotify. Um, can I, or would I have to ask that? Cover, sorry, a cover, a cover of a cover of another another artist's song. Uh, can they just straight upload that to Spotify, or again, is that not possible? Um, you do have. I mean, it, again, it depends whether it's an adaptation. If it's a straight cover, and number one, if there's no no change in in lyrics or no adaptation. Um, then you are entitled to release cover recordings. There's, there's, there's no problem with that. Um, the publishing royalties won't go to you. You'll only get um, artist royalties. You can't claim, I mean, Spotify don't pay all that much anyway, to be honest, yeah. But as I'm sure you know. But uh, the publishing royalties have to still go back to the publisher because it's a cover yeah. recording. You get the artist royalties. You get your master recording rights. Not going to be yeah. very much not going to be a fortune because and I don't know how much Spotify pay on master recordings. It's it's not very high. Um, thank you. No one here. I would like to get into the sync industry. What's the best route to get my foot in the door? Okay. Uh, Synchronisation departments exist both on the publishing side and on the record label side. So you can go either way. Go either way. I mean, if you're keen, contact the uh, the major publishers and the major record labels. They all have sync departments. It's all in the, you know, it's all on the internet. You can easily find those departments. Just look for licensing when you go to the record label and they'll normally send you straight through to a contact. Um, and just tell them what, what, what your talents are, what you're keen to do, and see if you can get in on the ground floor there. They're, they're always looking for people. You know, there is turnover of staff. So uh, it's 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 always easy, you know possible to get in at that level. So uh, another one here. Um, given your given your um, of course thirty year background in the industry, how would you say then sort of things have changed within copyright industry in the close sort of future and, and, and moving on from there? Really, how have they changed? Well, I don't know where where how how much time have you got? <laughs> um, 
it's become much more competitive and not always in not always in a good way. I mean, there are some some aspects that are good. We've got so many TV channels now and so many internet platforms. There are lots of spaces for music to be used, so that's great. But there are a lot more people out there wanting to do that. Um, it's very competitive in the writing field. Um, it's always good to to be able to get a good social media following because then you know you can pick up pick up a fan base and people can notice you. You don't necessarily need to have a big publisher behind you. It can help. It can help because uh, they they will give you a leg up. Other developments are well. There's a lot of infighting in the industry. You know, there's a lot of you might have seen on the news. Facebook have got themselves into huge trouble in Australia because they don't want to pay for content from news publishers. And they probably don't really want to pay for music either, to be honest, you know. So there's a lot of arguing going on. So not all the developments have been great. But as I say, to counter that, loads of new platforms, loads of new places to use music. It's much easier to release music than it used to be. In the old days, you know, you had to go through a formal company set up. Now you can, you know, you can do the kind of the Arctic monkeys business model, if you like. You can just get it out there yourself. You know, you can be your own record label if you want. So it's, uh, you know, there's some good developments as well. Um, mixture of changes, I'd say, a mixture. Hope that um, helps. Wonderful, yeah. Uh, um, let's have a look. Uh, I've got another cue here. Uh, after the mentioned 70 years of the death of the writers, do the owners have the ability to extend the ownership? A question from Stephen. Not in the UK, not in this country. Under English copyright law, 70 years is it, and then it falls into the public domain. Different story in America where copyrights can be renewed. Um, don't ask me about that because it's immensely complicated. Every country has its own copyright rules. In uh, Austria and Germany, I believe, or particularly in Austria, the copyright period was suspended during the Second World War. So there are six years bolted onto the end of it. In this country, it's fixed. It's 70 years from either from the death of the last surviving author or from when the record was released for the master. Uh, is it correct the instrumental electronic music is a hard sell to sync as it is typically used as background texture and can be created by a composer on a laptop or licensed from production music libraries on the cheap? Um, it's not a hard sell. It's used that way. I mean, I've seen electronic music used in, in lots of productions. Um, it just depends what the kind of um, what the producer wants. Uh, it's not it's not a hard sell at all. If they if they want it, um, they will they will go for it. You can't force music into a brief that doesn't require it. That's the thing. You know, a lot of people a lot of people think they can just set up their music and send it to loads of people, and somebody will buy it. But it doesn't really work like that. In all my years as a music supervisor. Um, I've always had to react to a request. When I send stuff out cold, it doesn't usually work. You know, we have to react to a brief. So there's no reason why electronic music shouldn't be used if the brief is right. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, one from Brad here. Uh, I have a track that uses samples from a YouTube compilation of Mark Hamill's animated Joker. Love to hear that. Um, what would be, well, what, what, what would the problems be surrounding releasing that track? Getting permission of all the people who own the samples. <laughs> um, bit fiddly, but you need to do it. Go and go and get the samples cleared. Whatever rights are sitting in there. Was it so? You've got you've got music rights in there. Have you got other rights in there as well? I think because you were talking about animation. I think as well. So sounds like there's a bundle of things to clear. Not not the easiest thing to do. If you've got a sample, you have to clear it, otherwise you can't release it, um, no matter how little the segment is or where it is. Go, Brad. Bit of a difficult one. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, good, good idea. Let's have a look. We've got another one here from Derek at Radis. Um, is there a simple method for getting a license for a re-record or re-recording, e.g. a cover of a pop song, to ensure payments are made and the likes of YouTube recognise the newer version and do not block it? Um, I suppose if you registered it with um, the MCPS and made sure that it was logged that way, you ought to get your royalties that way. Um, yeah, if it's a cover recording, so 
Yeah, that's probably the best thing to do to make sure, and also PPL, to make sure that they both know that your recording is a cover and it's not the original. Um, that would be the best way around it, I think, to ensure that you get paid. Yeah. Of course, Wonderful. the publishing, publishing royalties are all going to go to the original publisher. There's no participation there. For a question from uh, Louis. Uh, where do you start in determining the cost of original recordings slash tracks for licensing? So again, where do you start in determining the cost for original recordings slash tracks for licensing? So does that person mean a commission music? Are they, are they talking about commission music or are they talking about commercial tracks? Bespoke music. Bespoke, bespoke music. Okay. That's very much up to the uh, the producer who is working for the, uh, you know, the music user. So maybe an advertising agency or maybe a film company. They will determine how much they have to spend. Yes, there is a little bit of toing and froing. You can bargain. But they, they tend to determine what the budget's going to be. And it's not only as high as we'd like, um, sadly. Um, but yeah, but that is the producer tend, tends to be that determines that. Um, um, got a message here from, a look for, from Emma. Uh, is there a site for copyright free vocal samples? Uh, not Splice. I mean, like vocals that are already known from other music. Sorry, can you, can you repeat that? Yeah, of course, can. It's, is there a site, a website, for copyright free vocal samples? Uh, she doesn't mean splice, which means uh, vocals that are already known from other pieces of music. Not that I know of, because if the vocals are known from a piece of music, they'll probably be protected. Um, so getting something that's copyright free, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit wary of some of those copyright free sites. You know, sometimes producers have said to me, oh, I found this, this website where I can use this piece of music that's free of copyright. I'm, I'm always a little bit uh, skeptical of those. Um, so I don't, I'm afraid I don't know. I don't know what that website would be. Sorry. Um, got a question here from Kevin. Actually, wanted to find out a little bit about your, uh, a little bit more about your day. Um, what does a typical day in your job look like? I.e., the process from start to finish, uh, and and how to do this. If that's if I've understood that question correctly, Kev, please. Yep. That's right. If I haven't got that right, Kev. Well, there's there's no commute to the office. No commute to the office. There you go. <laughs> um, Move free. Um, I think I go for everybody. Um, okay. <laughs> Well, if if we're if we're having a good day, then um, I'll give you I'll give you today because that's quite a quite a nice example because today was a nice busy day. Um, we've got a music search on for um, a radio production company, who um, perversely are working on a TV ad, but uh, they wanted me to search for a song to a given brief. So I will start looking through. Um, all of my publisher lists and talk to them because it's not good enough just to think of songs on my own. I often talk to publishers and record companies to make sure the budget's right so that I'm not aiming too high. So I might spend a couple of hours researching that. Then I'll go on to YouTube with my own ideas of what music I think works and cut and paste a few links. Um, then when I finish doing that, um, I'll do a bit of promotion with my advertising agency people. You're never, you're never too, um, you're never too old to do a bit more promotion, you know, no matter how busy your day, you always have to yeah. be looking out for new new opportunities. So I might spend an hour or two um, emailing advertising agencies, trying to call a few contacts. Um, then after that, I might send out a piece of existing work as a promo to show people what we can do. So, for example, we recently cleared all of the music for a podcast for a national newspaper. It was actually it was on the Guardian. It's not, it's not a secret. We, they did a podcast and we cleared the music for them. So I cut and pasted. I, I took a screenshot of the podcast. And I put it onto an email and I sent that to my address book, which is you know, like you know a few hundred people, hoping that I'll get a reaction. And then you know other parts of the day are kind of peppered with responding to emails that come in. Perhaps perhaps I'm trying to clear a couple of songs and I'm getting replies from publishers and record companies. So I'll field those. And then, yeah, then I'll try and listen to a little bit of music as well. That's the tricky bit. You know, is there enough time to kind of 
do that. So we get sent a lot of promotional stuff from from rights owners, and we try to listen to some of it, but there isn't enough time. There's just so much material out there. So that was typically kind of end of day, really. So yeah, a talk oh, show. Yeah. 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 And a wonderful webinar in the evening. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Finish off with the lecture. <laughs> um, um, what would it be? Uh, so a question from Stephen. We have already had this question, but I mean, yeah, just sort of again, uh, what is the best entry route for the career um, in music copyright? You sort of mentioned that a lot of sort of these companies have these departments. So what within your skill yeah. set towards them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, music music publishers. I, I, I favour those just because I I took that route. I worked in publishing for ten years. Um, music music publishers tend to have a sync department and a copyright department. The bigger ones do. So you can choose which one you you do. They also have a royalties department and an A and R department. Of course. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you get in there. You could float around if you're lucky. You know, if, if you go into the copyright, you know, you probably start off as a junior and just sort of do very simple stuff. But then you might find actually you quite like A&R and you'd like to do that or maybe marketing's your thing or maybe maybe you're good with figures and you want to go into royalties or, you know, maybe you even like legal stuff and you'd rather do the agreements. So you can you can move around if, if the publishers are, are amenable. I, I would say music publishers are just to start. Record companies do it as well, but I just... I know publishing better, so I, I know that they will do that kind of thing. Yeah. The, the big companies, you know, the Universals and the the BMGs and the uh, the Warner Chapels, they all have departments like that. Um, and thought, uh, we've got time for a couple of other questions, and then just I'll, I'll sort of round it all off. Um, let's have a look. Uh, a question again from Derek: um, What is or what are? Should I say what are the relevant um, of the MCPS and the PPL in the USA? And what is the what equivalent? Um, yeah. Only only in terms of reciprocal agreements, really, just making sure that their counterparts in America um, pay over to them. So that if you're a successful recording artist and you've got a good release and it's had a few, you know, had a, had a lot of plays abroad, that the counterpart in America, I think uh, it's uh, what's it called, the Harry Fox Agency, it's called in America, that they pay the money over to the MCPS and you get your money. And the same with PPL. I'm not sure what PPL is called in America, um, but they have they, they must have similar organisations. And all of these companies in Britain, they all have deals with with their equivalents abroad. So that's the way to get the money. That's the way. And if it doesn't come through the way you expect, push them over here. Phone up with the MCPS and send them an email and say, why aren't I getting my, my, my royalties? What's happened? Uh, just two more. Um, is that, so Tammy has asked, um, again, just talking about more, more specifically about the skill set that is required uh, to work in the copyright industry. Uh, is it a case of you know, knowledge about the law? You know, what would you potentially look for if someone was working for your consultancy? Um, I think when you go in on the ground level to, to, co uh, to a copyright department, you need to have good attention to detail. You need to be good at uh, pick it, picking out the, uh, the little details about deals. Um, you need to have quite good communication skills because you're dealing with you're often dealing with lawyers and legal departments. Um, so you need to be able to express yourself very well, uh, both in writing and verbally. Um, and obviously have a passion for music because that really helps. You know, it's it's great if you're really interested in, and to understand how all of the mechanics of the industry work. Try and pick up as much as you can about um, how all of the different parts of the industry fit together. Um, and I think, as I said, really, a passion, a passion is really helpful. If you love music, it really helps. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, uh, we've got one more here from Paul. Um, is it true that certain parts of the music business exist to fleece the writers and the artists? And if so, how do we avoid them and uh, <laughs> deal only with the good guys? We'll finish up on that one. <laughs> I think you get that in every industry. You'll always get a small minority of companies who are out there just to make and make a fast buck and, and you know to rip people off i don't know i mean the it's hard it's hard to know how to recognize those um what can i say if you're if you're at the stage where where you're doing some kind of a deal it's always good to have some legal advice that would certainly help um and in terms of trying to spot the companies that are charlatans i mean I don't know. Keep keep your eye on the music press. Keep your eye on the on the wider press to see if any reputations have been been you know been thrown out in the open. I don't I don't know. I mean, the music industry has got a few a few bad apples in it. They all industries do, and you just have to try to 
take take it carefully think about who you're dealing with and um and say keep keep an eye out in the press and what's on the internet maybe word will get out that these people are not to be trusted and uh, do it that way amazing amazing well again from everyone here thank you very much do, do you tony have any sort of um social media accounts that people can follow you follow you on and, and stay in touch with or um, I go onto LinkedIn quite a lot, so I, I follow that. I don't really use Twitter and, and sort of Instagram very much. It's not really my, my thing, I have to say, <laughs> in terms of get, getting a following. A lot of our work comes through, through personal contacts. Um, but, yeah, link, LinkedIn's okay. We use use that as far as social is concerned. Um, yeah, and that's it, really. So, wonderful, wonderful. Amazing. Well, as, as I mentioned so earlier on the call as well, of course, we've got the business course um, approaching obviously thank you very much with um or thanks to the the new sort of uh, uh guidelines we will be open as a school on the 8th um and again with the business course uh, with tony rig we're running through similar sort of content to what tony's mentioned today but also other areas as well tony Orchardson, thank you very much for your time today um i'm pretty sure everyone here and um, if they weren't unmuted uh would say the same that they've <laughs> they found it very very informative um and, and run through everything from there. But yeah, thank you very much, Tony. It's been really nice talking to you, Omar. And thank you, everybody else, for tuning in and, and listening. I hope, I hope you got something out of it. Uh, and I look forward to uh, to coming back another time. But thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Thanks Take a lot. Care. Thanks a lot for joining, everybody. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Thank you. Bye then. Bye.